That's f***ing slippery. Jeez, dude, with my tire, that's good at it. <laughs> G'day, guys. Welcome back to another episode of Think 4x4. Tonight, we're going through a full rig rundown of my petrol 80 series Land Cruiser, including all the modifications I've made since I purchased it seven years ago. I bought the car in a fairly stock condition. It had only a few minor modifications, bull bar, snorkel, basic suspension lift. Basically enough for an enthusiastic young kid to get out there and enjoy the bush in an epic car. The point I'm trying to make is you don't need a home loan to go out and buy a 4 and enjoy four-wheel driving. Everything you see here is a product of my own time and money. In saying that, 4 are an absolute money pit and without this, I'd probably own a couple of houses by now. Might even be living in Sydney Harbour. But here we are, I love it a bit. This is my journey over the last seven years. There you go, there you go, get up. That's it, on. There we go. That's it, the 80. Why can I not go forward? The winch that came with the car was a Roo Systems. Didn't work, first puddle I got the cruiser stuck in, it spooled out and wouldn't spool back in. So, absolutely no good to us. I upgraded the winch, what we've got now is a Runva 11 XP. It's a low mount, 11,000 pound winch running Dyneema rope. Perfect, does everything that I need, is super reliable and it's one of the best mods that I'd have on this car for going out doing solo trips. For example, when we're in the high country, we got bogged on the way to camp, it's just this one car. I'm on the bonnet, winch is partially submerged. I got no issues that it's gonna work. It's also good for recovering other vehicles. Up at the Cape, our last day, bog patrol, shockingly bog patrol, double line pull, 280 series, two anchor vehicles to get this thing out. So far, the run butt has not let me down been an awesome bit of kit. Next up is lights. Typical P-plater, lights before lockers, right? What you see here are not the first lights I bought. Being on a uni budget, we went with the eBay special. So a couple of LED lights to make the car look cool and help us see for those night runs in Wombat. Right now, what's on the car is an EFS 28 inch light bar on the top. And what I used to have on the front, which you might've seen going up to Cape York, were my Steady Type X Pros. Now, unfortunately, Ben's backyard welding of the mounts on the bull bar snapped on the corrugations, and we don't have the steadies on, but they're here, and they're one of the next mods to go on the car. All right, right after the lights and a lot of full driving, we found the limit of the 80 out in the bush pretty quickly, which meant the next modification was a rear locker. We went with an ARB air locker, including a single compressor, which lived under the bonnet. The reason I went that way, I didn't want an auto locker in the rear and an e-locker was way out of my budget. ARB seemed like the best option. Since then, you might have seen in a couple of our episodes the compressor cycling more than it should be and me probably swearing in the background. How's that air compressor going? You gotta be f***ing me. You definitely got the locker in. Copy that one, leaking locker, check. I've had a lot of air issues, but right now the locker's working, the compressor's working, and a fair few years later, we've upgraded the front locker and a bigger compressor as well. The car started off on a set of BFG KM2's uh, mud terrains. They were a 33 inch tire size. Once we burned through those, the next set of shoes were a set of Nitto mud terrains. The reason I went down the Nitto path Research I did at the time suggested they were a better tyre, and I absolutely agree. This is now my second set of Nittos, and this is in the 285-75, so the 33-inch size. I absolutely love them. Very aggressive sidewall, bag down all right, heaps of meat. The first set I got over 40,000 Ks worth of abuse. These have been such a good tyre. In saying that, last year I treated myself and we got a set of 35s. I wanted to go down the beadlock path. So these are a dirty life 
aluminium beadlock. They're a Neg 38. They're a big offset, big tire. They're my play set for around here when I want a light setup and to really go tackle some tough tracks. For example, earlier this year we tackled Red's Trap, which is one of our locals in Tulangi State Forest. We had the big tires on, aired down 8 psi, absolutely awesome. Light car, nice technical climb, perfect tire for it. In saying that, there's no track I wouldn't tackle with the 33s. And we took these up to Cape York, we did the tele track with them. Being the 33, they kept us on the legal side. Oh no. It's respectable on the road, no issues at all on the old telly with these tyres. Okay, so going into some advantages, disadvantages of both tyres. For starters, purchase price. So, Steely's, $100 a rim. Nice and cheap, super strong, very readily available. Tyres, the 33s are around $350 a tyre. Okay, not too bad at all. That's for a premium mud terrain tyre. When you look at the 35s, we're up around the 450 mark per tyre. It's on a 17 inch rim. It's on an aluminium machined beadlock. This whole set cost around $6,000. So massive difference in, in price alone there. Other things you'll notice, the speedo when you run the 33s is nearly bang on. It's only a couple of k's over. When you run the 35s, it's about 15 kilometers out. So if I'm doing 100 on the highway, I've got to be 85 on the speedo with the big tires on. Not really a big deal once you get used to it, but it's definitely some adjustment at the start. You push all of your drive line a lot harder with 35s. So starting's different in first, it's, it's longer. When you're in low range, your crawling speed's a lot quicker with the bigger tyres, and there's a bit more wear going on in your drivetrain components with the bigger tyres. Big advantage though, obviously bigger tyre raises your diff up higher, which gives you more ground clearance. Ultimately, that's where your off-road capability comes in. And the fact that they're a beadlock, meaning I can run nearly zero pressure in them, and the tyre is bolted to the rim, so we won't have any issues there. Here it is, God's motor, the 1FZ, the heart and soul of this car. Started off when I bought it, had a brand new head on it because it was running on gas and the old head, the factory head, had all burnt valves from the gas system. So when I picked it up, it was still running on gas. Great system, I loved it. Disadvantages were, it's, uh, it was a Venturi, so it was like a carbureted gas system and the gas tank in the rear was a great thing for hitting rocks on the track. But otherwise, I bought the car and gas was 40, 50 cents a litre. Even though it was chewing 20, 25 litres, 100, didn't really bother me because it was absolutely peanuts to run. Very good. The only reason that we pulled the gas off was when we went up to Cape York and the fact that we can't get gas up there. That's why we had to take out the system completely, run a long range petrol tank, yeah, purely for that. I have no intention of going back to gas now that the car's back here. Absolutely love the straight petrol life. What we did to make this run a little bit better than factory, we've advanced the timing, which means that that's the point where the spark plug ignites on your compression stroke in your, in your combustion chamber. Uh, from factory, they come fairly conservative, fairly retarded. They're at about, I think they're at about three degrees before top dead center for firing from factory. So I've advanced it. It's running at around 12 degrees now. It means I only run premium fuel, but there's a small power gain that we get out of it. So anything that this old girl can get in terms of power moving this big thing, we'll take. That's pretty much everything I've done engine wise apart from regular maintenance. It's been a very, very, very reliable motor. We've had it in water up at Cape York. You'll notice when we went through river crossings, we'd put a bra on, um, water would get close to the bonnet, it would, uh, sorry, close to the windscreen, it would at least get on the bonnet on Frenchman's when we did Nolan's on the telly track. 
and the car was no dramas at all electronically. Absolutely great. Only thing that has happened to it, we got a bad batch of fuel up at the Cape and it was actually on our way down we noticed a massive power decrease out of this thing. And it wasn't until we finally got home and started diagnosing we realised that all the injectors had, had nearly fully clogged. So they all came out, went in a UV bath, got cleaned out and it runs better than ever now. Some of the upgrades we've done in the engine bay, it's fairly factory, you'll see in that corner there, dual battery system. It's a lead acid battery, very basic system. We run a Red Arc Smart Isolator. It's a 100 amp isolator. All it does is, when the main battery is above 12 and a half volts, the solenoid closes and it connects both batteries, meaning the alternator charges both. And then when the main battery drops, again, below the 12.5 threshold, the, second ba the isolator disengages, the second battery runs solely on its own and that's what powers everything in the rear of the car, the fridge, the lights, all that sort of jazz. I've also wired up the isolator so that there's a button in the cab if I want to lock it open or lock it closed so that they're both connected for starting purposes. So if I want to jump start off the second battery or any time I want to winch to add twice as much power, um, I can flick that on which locks both batteries I gotta say, no matter how much you prepare for a big trip like Cape York, you can never foresee what's gonna break down. And for us, it was the middle of New South Wales, it was hot, and what happened? The AC compressor went. So we went old school, it was shirts off, windows down for the whole trip up, and I'm still finding red dirt all throughout the car. Yeah mate, I've jumped on your bandwagon, the shirts come off, should have come off earlier to be honest. It's, uh... No good having no AC, but you know what? We're in the middle of nowhere, why not? Right, we've got a long time ahead of us, you might as well work on that hand while you've got nothing else to do. That's exactly right, nothing like one side of your body and the other side pale. Another mod we've done in here, we've moved the winch control box inside the engine bay. It's a mod I've, I wanted to do for a long time, it actually lived on the front for a while but I've got an isolator tucked in front of the main battery and then back here is my solenoid. So we ran extended cables to the winch motor and from the solenoid, a couple of control cables which go into our roof console, meaning we can be in the car very easily, winch in, winch out without having to run out and connect into our control box. Very simple, easy, and just a nice mod to have. You'll notice on the right hand side the factory headers aren't there. The exhaust system's been upgraded. Not by choice actually on this one. What you can see there are extractors and it's about a two and a half inch system all the way through just with a hot dog muffler and cut short at the end. I actually upgraded the exhaust only because the original one got caught in a rut when I was reversing backwards and I ended up wrapping the exhaust around the back axle. Once again on the Three Sisters track. God, that's done some damage to this car. Anyway, now that we've spoken about the engine, let's go through the driveline components that are bolted to it. Next up, getting into the nitty gritty. One of my calipers seized once again on the way home from Wombat. What that meant was all four calipers came out and we rebuilt them. So we put new pistons, new seals through them. At the same time, we took the opportunity to run extended brake lines and new brake pads, DBA slotted rotors as well. Moving on to the very front here, uh, a freewheeling hub. Right, so you'll know that 80s come out full-time four-wheel drive. It's, it's an awesome feature of the car, but when I bought it, there was a lot of backlash in, number one, the drive flange here, the full-time drive flange, and the transfer case. So you got your spider gears in your center diff, a lot of backlash there, which meant every time you took your foot off the clutch, the whole car would, would clunk, essentially. 
and I dealt with it for a little bit, but then I got fed up with it. Two options I had, rebuilt the transfer and put a new flange on or put a part-time kit in it. The rebuild was around two and a half to three thousand dollars compared to six hundred dollars for a part-time kit. So we went down the route of a part-time kit. I started off with AVM hubs. They are, yeah, they're a cheap option. They're strong. Biggest downfall that I didn't like about these is they use these aluminium star head bolts. Not a common tool that you would normally carry out bush and the seal is pretty average. So I always found myself with water in these. If ever I got stuck in a puddle and the wheels didn't move, I could pretty much guarantee water would get in the bearings. But they did the job for the start. So what's involved with the part-time kit was two AVM hubs either side and you take the spider gears out of the transfer, you put a new centre diff in. That means inside the car when you push the centre diff button, it then locks the front. When the car drives in rear wheel drive only, which is how it is now, a lot of people report lighter steering, better fuel. I didn't really find any of that. The front end's a, a little bit lighter. Um, yeah, biggest advantage, well, there really was no advantage apart from losing the backlash, to be honest. Biggest disadvantage is I don't like how the car drives on dirt. It's a nightmare. In two-wheel drive, it, it wanders on the dirt. It's terrible. So whenever we go out bush, I always have to get out, lock the hubs, turn in four-wheel drive when driving on a dirt road or else it's, it's too floaty. It's too floaty. It was a good upgrade early on. It was cheap. Took away my backlash. There's a couple of nice things that you can, you know, be in low range and only be in two-wheel drive. But otherwise, uh, doing it again, I'd go down the path of keeping it full-time and rebuilding the transfer but the one downside I haven't mentioned is if you want to upgrade the strength of the front end you need to run part-time A's and hubs which is what we have now so once we chewed through our first axle and CV um, we decided to go chromoly so I had front end it's been built new diff solid spacer with a locker in it and then we ran chromoly axles and CVs, and they're co directly compatible with the Azen hub. So AVM went out, went in the bin, and the Azen, which is genuine Toyota hub, went on much stronger, a lot better for water sealing, and one of the best things Toyota do is they only use a 12, a 14, a 17, or a 19 mil socket. So if you've got those four things in your car, you can pretty much pull the car apart the side of the track. You'll see us pull this apart on our Cape York episode. First day on the tele track, we had a ticking hub. This came apart, we had to fix the, the locking mechanism in here. I don't know what night it is, I think it's night 11. We're at camp on the Del Hunty River. The, the cruise of the front end's coming to bits today. So we've really started to hear a knock or a tick in the front end when it's under load, which is a bit worrying. We heard it yesterday on the Frenchman's. It was on and off today. It's it's more prominent, it's a worry. Tried to diagnose it today. I had this hub unlocked, I had that hub unlocked with the front locker in to work out what side it was. It wasn't happening. And then I've just pulled this one up and worked out the freewheeling hub wasn't disengaging. So the, the spring assembly that like throws forward into the hub, into the wheel assembly to lock this to the hub essentially was not retracting. So this wheel was always getting drive even when I thought it was unlocked and I was trying to diagnose the other side. So, yeah, we're gonna start with this. I'll get to the bearings, have a feel of them. Otherwise, um, we'll put the wheel back on, give the car a run once we can free this hub up and see if this is actually the issue or not. does that feel five times better than what we were trying to do today or what I can now move the hub with my hand rather than a set of plots so that's one issue out of the way 
Let's put this back together properly, get the wheel back on, have a couple of beers by the campfire. Working our way out from the diff, we upgraded all the knuckle studs under here, so they were all chromoly studs. The knuckle bearings have been tightened up um, a little bit for running the bigger tyres. New bearings, the hub's got chromoly uh, studs and nuts. The bearing inside here, this is a typical 80 series bearing lock nut. It's a star washer, so you bend the tab over your, over your bearing nut. I had an absolute nightmare of a time with these coming loose. So when we did a new front end, you can buy something from Trail Gear that is very similar to a Nissan Patrol, but it's, it's a chromoly nut and then it's actually got a locking stud that goes through it so your bearings cannot come loose. Awesome upgrade. I, I have never had a problem with a wheel bearing coming loose after that. These are the inner axle seals that normally come with any, any swivel hub kit you buy with this. You want to grab these and you want to get rid of them. All these old cars, they got a fair bit of wear on them, either in the housing or on the axle. Trail gear do a nice speedy um, axle seal that sits in behind the knuckle. Again, a whole lot better. It's a, it's a lot fatter. Um, seals the diff oil from coming into your knuckle. All right, so from driveline, working into suspension wise, because we sort of did that at the same time, we've got all new arms. So steering dampeners, road safe, the drag rod, track rod, they're all heavy duty uh, road safe arms. Nice thing about those is they have greasable ends, so greasable bushes, just a nice comfort thing. We've got Superior Engineering Hyperflex arms. I noticed a massive difference in front end flex once we put these arms on, going from a factory arm with an offset bush, which isn't really ideal, but it's, it's very very cheap to the hyperflex arms the caster in them is a bit more than the lift so it's a four inch caster and when it sits with the three inch lift it drives extremely well um, with the big tires on it wanders a little bit and i'd like a bit more caster but it's really good for what it is biggest disadvantage to these hyperflex arms is how low they hang and the fact that they collect everything Know, in the middle of the track. We've got road safe um, extendable sway bar mounts. So the sway bar is still in in the front and rear. Again, trying to stay on the legal side of things there. Tail shaft spacer. Moving on to suspension. The car started with a two inch, just a basic lift. When I started doing a few more trips and putting some more weight in the car, I had to go get heavier springs again heavy still not heavy enough when you load the back of the car up with food beer fuel people so we went heavier springs again in the rear it currently runs a three inch dobinson setup in the front coils with one inch spacer and then in the rear is some custom heavy duty springs as well with a one inch spacer so it sits around about four inch ride height we've got Remote Resi shocks, again Dominson. I started with their first gen, non-adjustables, and latest purchase for the car has been a set of adjustable uh, monotubes. So I'm very keen to see how they go against their previous generation of shocks. They're a six inch shock sitting with a three inch coil. So we've got retainers in the back. I've got to do some product testing to see if I'm gonna need some coil retainers in the front, but the car drives really well as it is. I'm very happy with suspension wise. The front end sits at a good height and when the back's fully loaded with we got 260 litres of fuel, you know, 70 litres of water, food, all of that, the back actually sits quite nice as well. What else is going on in the front here? When we went up to Cape York, you would have noticed we twisted the output shaft on the steering box so the one in here is actually from 
the wreckers up there at Bamago. It was an absolute steal of a find. It's probably the only 80 series steering box that doesn't leak, that I've come across anyway. Yep. Good thing we pretty much brought every tool in the shed we need to disassemble an 80 series. <laughs> sort of taking a risk here. This looks like one of the newest 80s that's come in. Yeah. He did say it's only recently been stripped for parts. It doesn't. Looks like it's been here for a little bit. I can't really see the steering box leaking. It's a bit strange because every 80 series steering box leaks, so this is a, this is a risk that this box is a cactus. Yes! There we go. When we put that on, we got a uh, bracing plate put on the chassis because after the trip we noticed cracks in the pan hard mount to the chassis um, so it's got two compensator plates and the welds have been repaired where the pan hard bolts into the chassis what else can i talk about moving around the front of the car you, you'll see two yellow recovery points they're one of the very first modifications i put on the car and actually one modification that if anyone comes out with me i specify they must have recovery points so you might think back to when we went to Wombat to do Three Sisters track with Josh, very factory Prado, but a couple of things he did have, handheld UHF and recovery points because you bet they got an absolute workout. Front and rear recovery points are a must. These ones here are road safe. Basically all you've got to know with buying recovery points is they, they need to have a weight load limit stamped on them. So that shows that they've actually been tested to a load limit of some sort. These ones at the front are five ton working load limit. Obviously, when you think you've got a three, you know, three, maybe three and a half ton truck stuck and another heavy vehicle pulling it out, there's a very real chance that you're going to go over your working load limit, which is when you need to start considering equalizing straps. So using two of those brackets for a recovery or doing a double line pull off two brackets again. So we actually had to use these on the Teletrack day two. I got myself stuck and I was doing a single line pull. I snapped the winch rope, um, unfortunately. It was pretty silly when you think about it because the car was, was diffed out and I was trying to drag it up a sandy hill. Let's go to, let's go to both and put a tree trunk protector on. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Beautiful, I'm out. Thank you very much, guys. We'll see you at the next one. We might wait for you up the track. <laughs> yeah. Also, before we even got to Cape York, Jack's patrol broke down in the middle of God knows nowhere in Queensland and the cruiser had to tow about 800 k's to the nearest town. Pretty much guarantee whenever I go out there's always something that goes wrong and it's finally happened now. Go on. Jack's GQ won't start. Um, Mike, you're going to have to put yours around the recovery point.
If I have the windows down, I get the dust in the car, but if I open them up, it's too bloody hot. <laughs> oh, that's too funny, man. Too funny. Hey, Jack, I reckon you're going to owe us a couple of beers by the time we get to camp, because as far as I can see, the 80s fuel gauge is going down, and yours is not moving anywhere at all. How is the economy going at the minute, mate? Honestly, it's really good. I don't see why people would buy like a Tesla or a modern car. It's a city car. Yeah. Just buy a patrol and get it towed by an attitude. You have the best fuel economy you will ever see. Yeah, bloody typical of Nissan being towed by a Toyota. I tell you what, it's a good thing we got one reliable vehicle amongst the convoy. After we built the front end, we went up to Cape York. On the way down, you wouldn't believe it, on the highway, doing 100 k's an hour, I actually broke a rear axle stud. So that was the opportunity then, which meant we need to build the rear end. Solid spacer in the diff, chromoly axles and chromoly drive flanges, upgraded studs, so it's got more dowels and M10 studs. Once we started doing the harder four wheel driving, now that we were locked, I was putting the car in average situations and resting up against banks. Unfortunately, it meant we did a little bit of panel damage here and there, including the flares. The original flares that came on the car were a common thing that we were always pulling out of puddles or out of the side of the bank. I eventually got, got fed up with always gluing these flares back on, which is why we went the cut snake option. Definitely not my favorite by far, slightly better than factory. It was a good opportunity at that time we put all new flares on. They were second hand and he cost me a hundred, hundred or so dollars. Cheap investment there. And we went some bar work. That included scrub bars, both sides and sliders. The sliders are on a very aggressive angle because I want an aggressive approach. I want to be able to put the car and the jack on the sliders, lift the car up. The Scrub bars actually went back and got reinforced where they connect into the sliders so that they're stronger when we push on them on the side. The sliders, I also opted for an open option, which I quickly regretted because sticks and everything still found its way through the slider and would end up in the panel. So a year or so after we went into the sliders, we've got them filled in with checker plate and repainted then. While we're on the bar work, we'll head around the rear bar. That's probably one of my favorite upgrades so far. Very practical, not to mention you can use the high lift jack. Probably reference when we were in the, the Vic High Country, we had some brake issues in the rear. Very easy, high lift jack straight on the rear bar. The car's up, supported, um, and we can start diagnosing the problems. Here it is, the rear bar. It's a Razzler rear bar. The only thing I got custom with this were the side hoops. We got those put on because we did some quarter panel damage, unfortunately. Very basic rear bar, dual jerrys on the left hand side, petrol and water, spare wheel on the right, and I've made up a light on a swivel extendable pole there. Let's have a look inside. On to the back of the car. Before we even got to the drawers, we pulled out all the interior and we put in sound deadening. So the floor mats, um, all the interior panels came out and we went and put in roadkill sound deadening. You might have seen that episode. It was uh, an absolute monster of a job. Main thing was getting the old sound deadening out. So you had to dry ice all the old stuff that was stuck down to the body and, and scrape it out. Bit of a nightmare of a job. Once that was in, new carpet in, rear drawers. These got built by Full Bore Forby out uh, in country Victoria. They are an awesome setup. So they're, they're full depth to the back seat with a K-On cargo barrier. On the left hand side, it fits a Waco 75 litre fridge. Reason I went down this path is a whole lot more uh, inexpensive than an angle. It's a 75 litre, it's an awesome size, it's dual zone. You can have fridge freezer or freezer freezer. When we went up to Cape, there were five of us. We had two fridges, so this and another 60, and it was a good size. I wouldn't have anything smaller. 
It was packed to the absolute brim, so that was for five of us. Underneath the fridge, we've got a little table that extends out, bit of a chopping board, easy, side of the road, open up the fridge, get whatever you need, and you've got this table here. On the right hand side, three drawers stacked up. I got these made pretty much at the right height to fit a four litre bottle of oil, because on the trip we had to take you know, spare engine oil, spare diff oil. This bottom one houses all the tools, and you'll notice each drawer has got its own interior light as well. In front of the drawers, you'll see tailgate storage. This is a Lockie specialty. It was really actually quite handy for Cape York. So it's anything you want that you don't want to get the car dirty, you just throw in here. So we put, we put kindling, I got spare belts, spare hoses, stuff that you really never need to get to, but it's a neat bit of storage area as well. And it's a nice surface that, you know, you can, you can do anything on. It's a bit of a chopping board almost. All right, let's walk around the side of the vehicle. This is probably my favorite modification. These Cruiser Company Gullwing doors, they are epic. And I got the rear drawers built after we put these in with a backing, a backing plate. So on this side, there's a neat little area here. We had a camera charging station. This is a bit of a switch panel, so I control all the lights here, some charging ports, access to the water pump and compressor as well. So if I want to pump up tires or we just want air in here, real nice. Yeah, one of my favorite additions. We go around the other side, that gull wing's just straight into access to the rear of the vehicle. Anyone with a wagon and a tailgate would know anytime you pack anything at the front of the boot, you've got to pull everything out to get to it. But how good's this? I can get in straight away, access to the cargo barrier, all the way to the front of the boot. It's absolutely awesome, these gull wings. Definitely favorite mod for camping. Next up, we got the awning. I've actually had a few awnings since the car, so it came with just a eBay special. Another ARB normal pull-out awning came after that when I, when I had the old roof rack on. Wanted to upgrade for Cape York because we're living out of this thing for four to five weeks. I really wanted a nice awning that was waterproof and something that was easy to set up and offered big coverage. So. This is what we come up with, 30 second awning. It's absolutely epic. I think we timed ourselves. It took about 26 seconds by the time of opening the zip to have it round the car and up. It's freestanding. It's unbelievable. You pull up on the side of the road for lunch. You open this, instant shade, straight into the fridge. I'll show you guys just how easy it is. This was Lockie's job, because I'm too short. There you go, how awesome is that? Freestanding awning, up in seconds. Absolutely epic. This, the gun wings, the drawer in the fridge setup. My favorite camping mod. As you can see, the awning's bolted to a Rhino aluminum flat rack. It's not the first rack that came on the car. We actually started with roof bars, then it evolved into a steel roof rack. It's a cheap option. It worked absolutely fine, but a 70 kilo steel roof rack on top of top of the roof was just way too much weight. So that's why we opted for an aluminium rack. I absolutely love the Rhino. There's heaps of heaps of bolt-on parts you can get. So we mounted the high lift jack, we had a rake, we had a shovel, we had the chainsaw, we had a dog box, gas bottle, the awning, everything went up on the roof. It was it was great and it was light. All right, inside the car, still fairly factory. So what we've done audio system wise, upgraded the head unit. We've got 
six and a half inch speakers in the fronts, five and a quarters in the rear. Fronts have been amped. That's as far as I want to go. I'm happy with that. Up the top here, this is probably the most modified we've got in, inside. So I've got switches for all the lights, exterior, and then we've got winch in and out, winch power, battery isolator join like I spoke about before in the engine bay. Also got power, so that's for just charging, camera gear, air compressor, lockers, and storage up the top. Really plain, really simple, and we love it. All right, so the question remains, what are we gonna do with the engine? There's nothing wrong with it now, but that doesn't mean we won't do anything to it. Couple of choices. Do I leave it? Do I turbo it? Do we put something else in? It's definitely lived up to its reputation as God's motor. I absolutely love it. Best motor Toyota's made. However, I've also gone and purchased Toyota's second best motor they've ever made, a 1HD FTE. So currently sitting on the sidelines of, do I turbo this? because the Haltech's sitting in the shed ready to go. Do I bring the FTE and put that in it? Because that's the dream engine to run big boost and get big numbers out of a monster FTE. Would be awesome. If you've made it this far, I really do appreciate you guys watching this and listening to me waffle about where I spent the last seven years of my income. Be sure to like and subscribe. We might even see you out there on the tracks. Thanks guys. Oh God. Something's going on here. The front of Jed's car won't even turn. Might just be a hub. Right, eh? I think I've set the scene for everyone else. Jesus. Definitely did not expect that.